The Russian Civil War began in the aftermath of the Great October Revolution of 1917. While the revolution itself was almost bloodless, the civil war that followed was one of the most tragic periods in Russian history. Violence and cruelty became commonplace in the four years that followed, and hopes for democracy were crushed. Russia was ruled by a small group of revolutionaries known as the Bolsheviks, who understood only too well what they must do to hold the power they had seized. Those who opposed the Bolsheviks understood that these new leaders would irrevocably change Russia. The struggle between the Bolsheviks and their enemies shaped the new Soviet state and its later development. Millions were killed and crippled, while hundreds of thousands, the bloom of the nation, left the country never to return. The causes of the Russian Civil War were deeply rooted in Russian history. The First World War had caused desperate suffering among the Russian people, but other more long-standing problems were just as important. For centuries, Russian peasants had been tied to land they did not own and forced to work for others. In 1861, only two civilized nations, the United States and Russia, permitted one man to own another and force him to work against his will. But in that year, as the United States began its own civil war to decide the question of slavery, Tsar Alexander II abolished serfdom in the Russian Empire. Yet vestiges of the old system continued to plague the vast majority of the Russian population, whose prospects for land and education remained severely limited. For Nicholas II, who became Tsar in 1894, the desires of many of his subjects for radical changes in government were difficult to accept. His indecisiveness plagued Russia and contributed to the country's internal problems. Russia entered World War I in 1914. By 1916, Devastating military defeats and internal problems aggravated by the war caused most Russians to believe that revolution was the only solution. In 1917, Russia experienced not one, but two revolutions. The first revolution took place in February. Born of frustration and disappointment, this revolution of cues demonstrated the lack of confidence of urban workers in their government's effectiveness. On March the 2nd, 1917, Nicholas II abdicated, and soon after, he and his family were arrested. Soldiers and workers in Petrograd banded together to form a quasi-governmental organization called the Petrograd Soviet. Its leaders represented two political parties, the Social Revolutionaries and the Mensheviks. Under the Tsar, the Duma had been Russia's parliamentary body. Now the Duma's provisional committee nominated ministers for its first cabinet. Prince Lvov as cabinet head and Pavel Milyukov as Minister of Foreign Affairs. Revolutionary parties did not play a significant role in the February Revolution, but the Bolsheviks acted immediately to take advantage of the new freedom released by the revolution and amassed the forces necessary to launch an offensive. In April, the German government granted permission for Vladimir Ulyanov, a Russian exiled in Switzerland, to return to his homeland through German territory in a sealed train. This man would play the key role in Russia's revolutionary history. He was known as Ilyin, Tulin, Petrov and Frey, but his most famous alias was Lenin. As the months passed, the provisional government lost popular support. Bolshevik propaganda hastened the erosion of police and military authority, and the government was unable to halt the disintegration of social order. Russia's people, convinced of the futility of the war, responded to anti-war propaganda. Combat action continued, but in the spring of 1917, fraternization between Russian and German soldiers began. Millions of peasants in uniform saw their fight as counterproductive. 
By summer, military command had collapsed and mass defection from the front lines began. These soldiers who voted with their feet were the largest group of combat-ready men Russia had ever absorbed from a war. In early June, the delegates to the first all-Russian Congress of Soviets in Petrograd heard Lenin state the Bolsheviks' intention to seize power. In July, the news of a military order issued under pressure from the Allies to launch a frontal offensive touched off a series of mass demonstrations. When the demonstrations became menacing, the government moved loyal troops into the city who brutally put down the unrest. The suppression of the demonstrations and the failure of the offensive brought down the head of the government, Prince Lvov, who was replaced by Alexander Kerensky. At the time, Kerensky, a socialist and a prominent lawyer, was a popular figure who, less than a year later, in flight from the Bolsheviks, would leave his country with a Serbian passport on the deck of a British cruiser, never to return. The commander-in-chief of the Russian army, Larv Kanilov, who participated in the conference, believed that only stronger measures would save his country. Late in August, he brought his wild division to Petrograd and attempted to establish a military dictatorship. His attempt failed. The division was disarmed and he was arrested. More and more people listened to Bolshevik calls for support. In Petrograd and other cities, Lenin and the Bolsheviks waged a determined propaganda campaign. The Bolsheviks set up a military revolutionary committee to plan and implement their seizure of power. Their military forces were loosely organized groups called Red Guards. The time had come. The capital of the Russian Empire was the city of St. Petersburg. During World War I, the city's name had been changed to Petrograd. After Nicholas II abdicated, the Winter Palace became the seat of the provisional government. During the week before the revolution, rumors of an attack circulated. The approaches to the Winter Palace were not guarded. Log barricades were hastily constructed, but provided almost no protection and the government troops assigned to protect the palace were young recruits and a battalion of women. The Bolsheviks, who had already captured the Smolny Institute, had more personnel and greater determination and confidence in their cause. The Bolshevik attack on the Winter Palace on October the 25th was not filmed, but in the week afterward, the damage from the attack was recorded. On October the 30th, the first military engagement of the Russian Civil War took place. The Bolsheviks' Red Guards faced Cossacks loyal to the recently overthrown government outside Petrograd. The Cossack general, Pyotr Krasnov, was arrested, but released almost immediately. Within a week, Soviet power was established almost bloodlessly throughout most of the former Russian Empire. But opposition remained, most importantly, in Moscow. Military cadets loyal to the provisional government seized the Kremlin, the State Duma, and other buildings in the city's center. The cadets made the Alexander and Alexis cadet schools their bases of operation. Red Guard units defeated their opponents, but lost a thousand troops in fighting that severely damaged Moscow's center. After General Kanilov's abortive attempt to assume power in Petrograd, he and other members of his staff were imprisoned in the town of Bukov. Because they believed they could justify their actions, none had attempted to escape. When Moscow fell, their lives were in danger. 
They were freed by the commander-in-chief of the Russian army and made their way south to the Don. The generals hoped to make common cause with Cossack Ataman Alexei Kaledin, who had seized power in the Don region and refused to recognize the Bolshevik government. Many of those loyal to the former government went south to the Don. There, the White Volunteer Army was formed from the remaining forces of the Russian army. The 4,000 men were united in their hatred of the Bolsheviks. General Mikhail Alexeyev became the first supreme commander of the Volunteer Army. He had been commander-in-chief of the Russian forces, but was now dying of cancer. When General Karnilov arrived in the south, he assumed military command, leaving civil and diplomatic matters to Alexeyev. The volunteer army badly needed arms and ammunition. Russia's military industry was concentrated in the country's center, now almost completely controlled by the Bolsheviks. So the whites turned for help to Russia's former allies who were still at war with Germany. The French, British and Americans to whom the whites appealed could not decide what groups to support and what aid to send. In December 1917, Bolshevik troops headed south to the Don, collecting scattered red units on the way. The march marked the beginning of the Echelon War, a period that lasted until mid-1918, when no front lines existed and fighting along the railroads went on with uprisings in urban areas. Red military forces were small and highly mobile. Cossacks had traditionally been considered the most loyal supporters of the empire. Grand Prince Alexei, the son of Nicholas II, had held the title of Ataman of the Cossacks since he was four years old. The highly trained and well-equipped Cossacks had formed the emperor's crack guards. The Don Cossacks were formidable opponents of the Bolsheviks. But many Cossacks were disillusioned by World War I, while non-Cossacks of the Don were leaning towards the Bolsheviks. Many people who lived in the Don opposed Kaledin's union with the commanders of the volunteer army and the politicians who had fled to the Don from Petrograd. These men, who wanted to revive Russia as an indivisible state, were unwelcome by the people of the Don, who wanted to create an independent state. On January the 10th, 1918, the Congress of Frontline Cossacks stripped Kaledin of his powers as Ataman, and Kaledin shot himself. General Kanilov decided to leave the Don and lead the volunteer army to the Kuban. Avoiding the more numerous Reds, Kanilov's forces joined the troops of the white Kuban government and reached Yekaterinodar, the capital of the Kuban. The volunteer army's trek across the snow-covered Kuban steppe became known as the Ice March. On April the 8th, Kanilov attempted to take the Kuban capital. The assault was beaten back and only 1,500 men were left in the volunteer army. Kornilov decided to attack again, but in the early morning hours of April the 13th, a shell hit the headquarters of the volunteer army, killing Kornilov himself. It was a blow to his men. General Danikin assumed command and decided to retreat from Yekaterinodar. Now only two factors saved the volunteer army from defeat. Mounting anti-Bolshevik sentiment in the Kuban Cossack villages and indecisive Red military forces. Instead of pursuing Denikin's forces, the Reds exhumed Karnilov's body and displayed it in the city. In May 1918, Denikin led his troops back to the Don. New Cossack volunteers increased the size of the army to three and a half thousand men. 
by late 1918, the volunteer army posed a serious threat to the Bolsheviks. In November 1917, Colonel Alexander Dutov, the Ataman of the Orenburg Cossacks, launched a campaign in the southern Urals. A red unit commanded by 27-year-old Vasily Blücher was sent to the southern Urals. Blücher's military strategy reinstated Bolshevik control in the region by January 1918 and Dutov retreated. Grigory Semyonov led a rebellion against the new Bolshevik government in the Baikal region. Semyonov's attempt to seize the region's main city failed and the Reds drove the Cossacks into Manchuria. The winter after the October Revolution inflicted greater suffering on all those who lived in Russia. Starvation first claimed the lives of the very young and the very old. Food supplies dwindled, lines grew longer and longer. Chaotic administration and a lack of fuel paralyzed the country's railroads so that the distribution of food was even more difficult. And despite their more desperate attempts, the Bolsheviks were unable to feed the population. At least half of the bread that did reach Russia's starving cities was brought by itinerant traders known as bagmen. And although the Bolsheviks identified these people as enemies of the state, they were forced to allow the private trade in bread both in the cities and the countryside. The Bolsheviks' most important concern was to fight against the growing opposition forces. At first, the Bolshevik military had included only Red Guard units made up of workers too few and poorly trained to wage war. In January 1918, the Bolshevik administration issued a decree forming the Workers and Peasants Red Army. A system was introduced to train new recruits 16 to 40 years old. A committee for military and naval affairs was formed. In March 1918, Lev Trotsky, formerly in charge of foreign affairs, was named the first Bolshevik commissar for military affairs. Combat on the Russian-German front had stopped in the fall of 1917, and talks began on November the 22nd in the town of Brest-Litovsk. Ludendorff, the leader of the German delegation, and Trotsky, who headed the Bolshevik delegation, fiercely opposed making peace. The Bolshevik position was weakened by direct negotiations between the Central Rada, the Ukraine central government, and the Germans. The Rada, under pressure from a Bolshevik offensive launched against the Ukraine in December 1917, made important concessions to the Germans. On February the 9th, 1918, two weeks after the Red Guard had taken Kiev, a treaty between the Ukraine and Germany was signed. The Germans now had authority over the entire Ukraine, the Crimea and the Donbass region. Kaiser Wilhelm II could now legally use the Ukraine as an economic base for continuing the war. Talks with the Bolsheviks broke down, and on February the 18th, the Germans launched an offensive on the entire line that stretched from the Black Sea to the Baltic. The Germans moved with lightning speed. They entered the three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, and the infantry set out for Tallinn, one of the most important bases for Russia's Baltic fleet. But five Russian cruisers with 10-inch guns posed such a serious threat to the Germans that they were afraid to attack the city. On February the 25th, the Russian Navy withdrew to Finland and then to Kronstadt. Six battleships, five cruisers, and more than 200 smaller vessels were saved. The 
Meanwhile, the rapid advance of the Germans forced the Bolsheviks to agree to a humiliating peace treaty. On March the 3rd, 1918, the document was signed by Georgi Chicherin, who had replaced Trotsky as head of the Bolshevik delegation. Their reluctance to negotiate with Germany cost the Bolsheviks dearly. The original line of demarcation was moved to reflect the new advances of the Central Powers. The Bolsheviks were forced to demobilize their forces, renounce their claims on Lithuania, Poland and Kurland, and recognize the independence of the Ukraine and Finland and German occupation of Russian territories. Two days before the Bolsheviks signed the treaty at Brest-Litovsk, the Germans entered Kiev. 29 infantry divisions and four cavalry divisions made up Germany's army of occupation in the Ukraine. Field Marshal Eichhorn was named commander-in-chief of the occupation forces. Red resistance had no effect on the German troops, who were slowed only by the distances across the Ukraine itself. Then in March, the Germans captured more than 80,000 prisoners and seized enormous quantities of weapons and ammunition. By April, the Germans had seized Odessa and advanced to the borders of the Don Cossack region. A puppet Ukrainian government was set up in Kiev under Getman Pavlo Skaropadsky. The government acted only on orders from the German military command. The economic union with Germany that the Ukrainians envisioned became instead a reign of fear and terror. Foodstuffs were requisitioned, terror became widespread, and concentration camps were constructed throughout the Ukraine. Guerrilla movements began to form, unleashing violence often more dreadful than that of the Germans. In February, the German army in the north advanced as far as Narva. Although it was the last Bolshevik stronghold on the way to Petrograd, it was defended by poorly organized and equipped red units who yielded the city without any resistance. Pavel Dubienka, commander of Narva's red forces, was stripped of his position, expelled from the Bolshevik party and brought to trial. He fled with his lover, Alexandra Kalantai. Later, he was acquitted and fought with the Red Army. The German threat to Petrograd forced Lenin to relocate the Bolshevik government in Moscow, Russia's ancient capital in the heartland of the country. By mid-March, the Bolshevik leaders were settled in the Kremlin with their families. The German offensive brought about the fall of Soviet power on the Don. In May 1918, the Circle of Salvation of the Don elected General Krasnov as its ataman. He ordered the execution of the leaders of the Don Revolutionary Committee and traded foodstuffs for German armaments critical to the military action he planned in order to liberate the Don. Other events also threatened Bolshevik power. On March the 6th, 1918, the British cruiser Glory landed at the northern port of Murmansk. Troops followed to protect Allied ammunition stores in the city. The Murmansk City Council sanctioned Allied defense of the city and the Allies agreed to provide staples for the local population and not to interfere in regional affairs. Foreign troops entered Russia's Far East. On April the 5th, Japanese ships sailed into the port of Vladivostok. After three Japanese citizens were murdered by Russians, Japanese marines supported by British soldiers took the city. The Allied contingent in the Russian Far East soon exceeded 90,000 men, 8,000 of whom were Americans sent to support the Czech Legion. The Czech Legion rebelled against the Bolsheviks in late May 1918, across the Trans-Siberian Railway from the Volga River to the Pacific Ocean. Czech units were traveling east through Siberia to reach the battlefields of Western Europe. 
These forces were centered in the area between the Volga and the Ural Mountains, where Russia's defense industry had been relocated. A group of Czech nationals living in the Russian Empire received permission from the Tsar to form a military unit. By the end of 1917, the corps numbered 40,000 and were perceived as a threat to the Bolsheviks. When the treaty between Russia and Germany was signed, the Czech National Council declared the Czech Legion a unit of the French army. Czech nationalists led by Tomasz Masaryk and Edward Benesch, hoped to use the Legion to fight for their country's independence. Masaryk reached an agreement with the Bolshevik government that allowed Czech troops in lands controlled by the Bolsheviks to travel to Vladivostok, where they were to board ships bound for France. Czech soldiers were to surrender their weapons, but their commanders feared the Bolsheviks would betray them. When the Czechs intercepted a cable from Trotsky with orders to kill any Czech found to be carrying a weapon, the Czechs attacked the Reds. Weak communist influence in the region helped the Czechs, who seized several cities on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. The Czech offensive revived anti-Bolshevik sentiments in the East. Despite the Reds' plight on the German front and the Don, more troops were needed to create an Eastern Front. But before this front was operational, other events intervened. Because Germany occupied the Crimea, the Bolshevik government ordered the Black Sea Fleet moved. Germany demanded that the fleet return to the Crimea. The Bolshevik government sent a second coded message to sink the fleet. Naval personnel finally complied after the arrival of Lenin's envoy Fyodor Raskolnikov. In late June, another British contingent of 2,000 men landed in Murmansk, and an Allied squadron of 147 vessels approached Arkhangelsk. Supported by local white forces, these troops took the city. The number of Allied forces in the north grew to more than 23,000. Their objective was to consolidate all regional forces that opposed the Bolsheviks. General Poole, the Allied commander, intended to drive his troops deep into Russia. Supported by 100,000 anti-Bolshevik Russians, the Allies were to link up with Czech forces. Poole's plan was unworkable, and the Allies made little progress on the Northern Front, but their presence dramatically complicated the Bolsheviks' relations with Germany and caused a rise in anti-Bolshevik activity within Russia. In Yaroslavl, right social revolutionaries under the leadership of Boris Savinkov rebelled on July the 3rd. Savinkov had been an infamous terrorist. Savinkov's forces were only defeated with barrages of heavy artillery. On July 22nd, the city lay in ruins. The red victory over Savinkov's forces coincided with the defeat of the left socialist revolutionary rebellion in Moscow. The left SR rebellion began in July during the fifth Congress of Soviets held in Moscow. A majority of the delegates had approved a policy of maintaining peace with Germany at any cost. The left SRs opposed making peace with Germany and attempted to force a break in the Brest-Litovsk Treaty by assassinating the German ambassador Count Leopoldus Mürbach on July the 5th. The next day, the left SRs, led by Maria Spiridonova, began an uprising in Moscow. They arrested Felix Zezinsky and 30 other Bolsheviks. The rebels seized the central telegraph office but could not take the Kremlin. On July the 7th, after bitter street fighting, 
units of the Latvian riflemen stormed the left SR headquarters in Moscow. Over 300 people were taken prisoner, 13 were later shot. This rebellion in Moscow was the aftermath of a bitter power struggle between the Bolsheviks and their left social revolutionary and Menshevik opponents. The Bolsheviks became determined to destroy all opposition to their revolutionary program. In December 1917, an organization called the All-Russia Extraordinary Commission, headed by Dzerzhinsky, was formed to fight opposition to Bolshevik control. During the next decade, it became an instrument of political suppression and a system of terror. It is symbolic that the Bolsheviks put up a statue of Robespierre, who had said, the basis of a democratic government is virtue. The means for implementing it is terror. Dzerzhinsky's organization, the Chika, launched an attack against the old order, and all the people and institutions that sought to preserve it were marked for destruction. The victims of the Chika's terror were selected not so much on the basis of crimes perpetrated against the new government, but on the basis of the threat they represented to the new objectives. In the months after the October Revolution, the Bolsheviks' political opponents used terrorist tactics reminiscent of the last decades of Tsarist Russia. In June 1918, the Bolshevik Commissar for Press and Propaganda was murdered. Then, on August the 17th, the head of the Petrograd Cheka was killed by a social revolutionary assassin. The Bolsheviks unleashed a campaign of terror against their opponents. The Red Terror became more intense after Fanny Kaplan, a member of the Social Revolutionaries, attempted to assassinate Lenin as he addressed the workers at a Petrograd factory. Bolshevik vengeance became more organized and the power of the Cheka was unlimited. Red Terror provoked not only the white opposition, but foreign troops and guerrilla partisans who retaliated by unleashing a terror of their own. Violent death became commonplace. After his abdication and arrest, Nicholas II, his wife Alexandra, their son Alexei, and their four daughters had been sent to Ekaterinburg, where they had been kept under guard. In July, the Bolsheviks feared that approaching white troops might free the former Tsar. On the night of the 17th, Local Cheka men executed the royal family. By the summer of 1918, Red forces had yielded large territories and Bolshevik Russia was no larger than the ancient Muscovite state. In the east, enemies of the Bolsheviks seized the cities all the way to Kazan. Earlier, an anti-Bolshevik government known as Komoch had been formed in the city of Samara. Now, Komoch troops and forces of the Czech Legion entered the city of Kazan, unopposed. The Serbian battalion that defended Kazan's Kremlin fortress had betrayed the Bolsheviks, and the Red Flotilla withdrew up the Volga without offering any resistance. During World War I, when the Germans threatened Petrograd, the gold reserves of the provisional government had been sent to Kazan. The whites seized the gold when they captured the city. The white presence in Kazan posed a far greater threat to the Bolsheviks than the loss of the gold reserves. From Kazan, there was a direct road to Moscow. And the Bolsheviks feared an attack on the capital. The Eastern Front was now critical and Lev Trotsky arrived near Kazan. Trotsky was second only to Lenin in the Bolshevik leadership. Like Lenin, he firmly believed in the rightness of communist dogma and he implanted this belief among the masses through his unequaled oratory. 
more than anyone else, Trotsky shaped and influenced the Red Army. An arch enemy of Stalin, Trotsky was doomed to disappear from official Soviet history. In the West, he would often be viewed as the antithesis of Stalin, and many would forget that Trotsky created many of the concepts that would become pillars of Stalin's socialism. To the Kazan front, Trotsky brought not only ammunition, but military discipline. He ordered deserters executed, then regrouped the Red forces. He singled out the best soldiers and appointed new commanders. Joachim Vatsetis, the commander of the Latvian riflemen, was placed in command of the Eastern Front. He, as well as 75,000 other Red Army officers, had served in the Tsarist army. As the empire collapsed, the Germans advanced, and their own troops disintegrated, they saw their primary objective as defending Russia. Trotsky believed his young army needed the knowledge and experience of these specialists. He was also aware that victory would require higher morale among the troops and a reimposition of the discipline that the Bolsheviks themselves had undermined before the revolution. But although Trotsky gave command authority to these former Tsarist officers, he appointed a Bolshevik commissar to supervise each one. Because Red military losses were immense, Lenin and Trotsky launched an active campaign at the rear to recruit and train new units. Five million people would eventually be trained in paramilitary organizations for the new Red Army. Near Kazan, in a combined operation, the forces of the newly formed Red Army won its first major victory. On September the 10th, the 5th Red Army and the ships of the Volga flotilla, supported by mine carriers from the Baltic fleet, took the city of Kazan. Trotsky referred to this victory as the event that taught the Red Army to fight. Two days after the Red Army consolidated a bridgehead on the eastern bank of the Volga, Simbirsk fell, thus opening the way to Samara, the capital of the anti-Bolshevik Komuch government. The Komuch escaped to Ufa, several hundred kilometers to the east, but by November, the Red Army had reached the city. The capture of Samara, a city in the largest grain-producing region, temporarily eased the Reds' food shortages. But hunger in urban areas continued, as Russia's peasants refused to surrender their grain supplies to the Bolsheviks. In May 1918, a system of compulsory requisitioning was introduced. The Bolsheviks organized food units. By the end of 1919, 70,000 men formed a food requisitioning army. Their work was simple robbery, and they caused starvation and death. Resistance was mercilessly crushed. One of the men appointed to head the food requisitioning units was Josef Stalin, who was sent to the Volga region in June 1918. Within a month, he had become chairman of the Military Revolutionary Committee on the Southern Front. Stalin's first combat command was at the Battle of Tsaritsyn, but he was not the architect of the strategy that saved the city from Cossack troops. 
Later, the minor role he played in the Red victories of the Civil War would be greatly exaggerated. Krasnov's Cossack army hoped to secure their stronghold on the Don by driving the Reds from Tsaritsyn, the strategic center closest to the Don area. From September 1918 to January 1919, Krasnov's forces encircled Tsaritsyn three times, but failed to take the city. After the bloody and exhausting battle, Tsaritsyn became known as the Red Verdun. Tsaritsyn cost the Reds dearly. In the autumn of 1918, 60,000 Red soldiers perished defending the city. The high casualties largely resulted from the incompetence of Stalin and Varashilov, who overrode the command decisions of former Tsarist officers. Months later, at the 8th Congress of the Bolshevik Party in March 1919, Trotsky attacked Stalin, Varashilov, and their associates. Lenin supported Trotsky's charge that ignoring experienced commanders and using guerrilla tactics caused the enormous red losses at Tsaritsyn. A majority in the Congress agreed with Lenin that the Red Army could not exist without iron discipline. Stalin never forgot his defeat or forgave Trotsky. The Red Army began its transformation into a powerful and well-organized fighting force. In the summer and autumn of 1918, the Red Army had to face not only Krasnov's Cossacks, but also Denikin's volunteer army. Denikin had finally received Allied aid. With fresh stores of material and ammunition and troop reinforcements, Denikin launched an offensive to Yekaterinodar, the capital of the Kuban, which the volunteer army had failed to take the previous spring. Denikin captured key railway stations and cut off the Taman Red Army located to the west. These 30,000 soldiers managed to join the major force of the Red Army, but could not save it from defeat. On August the 16th, Denikin's forces entered the capital of the Kuban. Soon they had taken the second largest city in the Kuban. By late autumn, the bulk of the Red Force had been driven to the edge of the desert-like sandy steppe, which would become a mass grave. The Whites paid dearly for their victory. 30-year-old General Markov, one of Denikin's closest associates, died of wounds. He had commanded the 1st Officer Regiment and an infantry division, both of which bore his name after his death. The Bolsheviks in Transcaucasia were also desperate. Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan declared their independence from Russia, but could not resist the Turks with their own military forces. The Baku City Council appealed for British aid. On August the 14th, 1918, a small British unit arrived. When they left a month later, Turkish forces entered the city. In November 1917, in the Central Asian region of Turkestan, Red forces held only cities in the central and eastern areas. The Turkestan Republic was cut off from Russia by Ataman Dutov's Cossacks and White Czech forces. In 1918, the forces of the Bukhara Emirate and the Khiva Khanat began to attack the Soviets throughout the region. The creation of a red military force in Turkestan was hampered by a tradition that prohibited military conscription. Still, by the end of 1918, the red Turkestan army numbered about 20,000 men. Red Guards units and guerrilla bands operated successfully against anti-Bolsheviks in Central Asia.
At the same time, critical events were taking place in Europe. On November the 9th, a revolution took place in Germany. Kaiser Wilhelm had abdicated and fled to Holland. The Social Democrats declared Germany a democratic republic. Workers and soldiers Soviets sprang up. A communist government briefly held power in Hungary. With the end of World War I, the Germans began a withdrawal from the Ukraine. Field Marshal Eichhorn shot himself. Germany's defeat freed Allied resources that could be diverted for large-scale intervention on behalf of the Whites. In November 1918, English and French ships entered the Black Sea and landed in Odessa and other Black Sea ports. The number of Allied troops in the south soon reached 130,000. Allied landings in Vladivostok brought more than 150,000 troops from Japan, Britain, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Serbia, China, Canada, Italy and the United States. The Daily Telegraph editorialized that no victory over Germany, however great it could be, would be complete if it were not accompanied by the liberation and reformation of Great Russia. Japan, in order to enhance its influence on the Asian mainland, strengthened its military presence in the Russian Far East. The Americans hoped to limit Japanese influence in the region. As 1918 ended, the entire Russian Far East was under the control of foreign armies. Americans and the Japanese held strategic points. Allied consulates were opened in the region's cities. As 1918 drew to an end, Soviet Russia's predicament was desperate, its future more and more uncertain. The Bolsheviks had been saved from defeat only by dissension among their opponents and the severe policies known as war communism that extracted the emaciated country's last remaining resources. Russia's economy was in ruins. Hunger and disease beset Russia's people. Thousands of homeless orphans formed a giant army of beggars. Most railways had been destroyed, causing the shutdown of many large industrial enterprises. Economic losses were incalculable, as was the toll in loss of life. Nevertheless, at the end of 1918, the new Bolshevik government had acquired the most important tool for maintaining power. A strengthened, enlarged and combat-ready army. In January 1919, the Red Army took Riga and Vilnius in the northwest, Kharkov and Baranovici in the south. The new Soviet governments in Lithuania and Belarusia combined to form a Soviet Socialist Republic. In February, the Red troops that took Kiev were welcomed by the city's residents who believed the Bolsheviks might restore stability. Antonov Avsienka was commander of the Ukrainian Front and Christian Rakovsky, head of the Soviet Ukrainian government. In the spring, the Whites were more successful. As Denikin launched his drive northward, 
the white position in Siberia changed dramatically. Admiral Alexander Kolchak, the renowned Arctic explorer, became supreme ruler. During World War I, Kolchak's effective leadership of the Russian Navy in the Baltic led to his appointment as commander of the Black Sea Fleet. After the February Revolution, he traveled to Petrograd and became an envoy of the provisional government to the United States and Great Britain. In October 1918, he returned to Russia and became Minister of War in the Omsk government. Two major anti-Bolshevik governments had vied for authority in Siberia. Komuch, the committee of the members of the Constituent Assembly, was formed with Czech support in Samara in June 1918 and later moved to Omsk. At the same time, the provisional Siberian government was established in Tomsk. The leader of the Tomsk administration, Pyotr Valagodsky, believed individual dictatorship would provide the most effective administrative system. He became the head of a third new government, the Ufa Directorate. And in November, with Allied help, masterminded a coup that transferred power from his council of ministers to Kolchak, now both supreme ruler of Russia and commander-in-chief of its armed forces. Kolchak's power was limited by obligations to the Allies. His decisions required the approval of General Yanin, the Allied commander in Siberia, and General Knox, responsible for Allied aid to the front. While Kolchak actually commanded only about half the military units operating in Siberia, his 112,000 men formed a powerful combat force. On March the 6th, Kolchak launched an offensive. Within a week, his troops took Ufa. By the end of April, they recaptured an area of 200,000 square kilometers with a population of 5 million people. The Reds and Whites fought for the territory of the Russian Empire, which encompassed one-sixth of the Earth's land surface and stretched from Eastern Europe to the Pacific Ocean. The two-week journey from Moscow to Vladivostok by rail spanned the vast, sparsely populated spaces of Siberia, Russia's Asian territory known for its isolation and harsh climate that extended from the Ural Mountains to the Far East. Lenin exhorted Russia's people to fight against Kolchak's rapidly advancing army. 15,000 communists responded to the Bolshevik appeal for reinforcements on the Eastern Front. Sergei Kamenev was appointed commander of the Front. Mikhail Frunze was placed in charge of the decisive southern section. Frunze's April attack on Kolchak's strike units unleashed one of the war's bloodiest battles. By mid-May, Kolchak's defenses crumbled, and in June, Ufa fell. As Frunze's advance continued, disagreement split the Bolshevik high command. Kamenev, backed by Stalin, wanted to press eastward against Kolchak, while Vatsetis, supported by Trotsky, planned a drive against Denikin in the south. Stalin prevailed, and the offensive in the east continued. In the Urals, troops under the command of Vasily Chipayev waged a successful campaign against Kolchak. Chipayev himself was wounded during a white counterattack and died trying to swim across the Ural River. He was immortalized in songs and stories of the war. During the summer of 1919, the largest cities of the Urals and Western Siberia, Perm, Ufa and others, fell to the Reds. By mid-October, the Reds were 500 kilometers away from Omsk, and in November, Kolchak's Council of Ministers, headed by Pipilyaev, left Omsk for Irkutsk. 
Kolchak left Omsk November the 12th in an armored train. Two days later, the Red Army entered the city. It took Kolchak two months to reach Irkutsk. On January the 4th, 1920, he transferred power to Grigory Simeonov. Simeonov, together with his henchman, Baron Roman Ungern, a psychopathic sadist and other Atamans, ruled the huge Baikal territory with a grisly terror known as the Atamanshina. The Japanese, in their attempt to secure control of the Far East, deployed greater numbers of troops in the region. By late 1919, the total was about 80,000 men. Like the Atamans, the Japanese also ruled with terror. Military units in the countryside killed all suspected Bolshevik sympathizers. Their atrocities destroyed white support and strengthened the Red position. European and American units would leave Siberia in the spring of 1920, but the Japanese maintained a large contingent of troops who continued to fight Red, White and Ataman forces. A wave of guerrilla movement swept Siberia. Guerrilla warfare had always been a key element in Russia's military strategy and continued so throughout the Civil War. Though guerrilla units were scattered and poorly equipped, entire divisions were eventually formed. Estimates of their numbers reached the hundreds of thousands. Minute knowledge of local conditions gave the guerrilla forces their unique advantage and their attacks kept the white rear disorganized and confused. Guerrillas operated throughout the country, except in the center. By the end of 1919, guerrilla units had surrounded Irkutsk, where Kolchak was preparing to leave his armored train. Before Kolchak reached Irkutsk, his authority had collapsed. Allied and Czech support was withdrawn. On November the 17th, Czech General Radola Gaida, the commander of the Siberian army, dismissed by Kolchak, staged an uprising against the admiral in Vladivostok. Following an uprising in Irkutsk, a group of Mensheviks and social revolutionaries formed a new government known as the Political Center. On January the 15th, Czech troops, with General Yanin's knowledge, arrested Kolchak and his associates not far from the city and turned them over to the local government. A few days later, the political center transferred power to the Bolsheviks. Kolchak became a prisoner of the Irkutsk Cheka. Records of his interrogation filled 19 volumes. On February the 7th, during a white army advance, the Cheka executed him without a trial. His body was thrown into a hole in the ice of the Angara River. After Kolchak's death, no threat to the Soviet regime existed east of the Ural Mountains. The Allied effort in the north also failed. Anti-war sentiment among the soldiers and the harsh environment hastened the decision to evacuate Allied forces. American units left Murmansk and Arkhangelsk and by February 1920, no foreign troops remained in the north. White hopes now focused on Denikin's forces on the southern front. At the beginning of 1919, Denikin was made commander-in-chief of the armed forces of southern Russia. A religious service in Yekaterinodar, the white capital, marked the event. Denikin played a growing political role as a statesman, a unionist, and reformer. But many of his progressive laws were never implemented. Denikin planned to consolidate all anti-Bolshevik forces under his leadership and deliver a decisive strike against the Reds. In the spring, Denikin eliminated the Red threat in the Ukraine. He then became commander of the Don and Kuban armies as well as the volunteer army. 
and launched a three-pronged offensive to the north. The left flank, commanded by Alexander Kutyepov, took Bielgorod on June the 23rd. Two days later, General Mai Maevsky reached Kharkov. But the most important action took place at Tsaritsyn, where General Wrangel's Kuban army, supported by British tanks and armoured vehicles, stormed the city. Young Cossack General Andrei Shkuro led the cavalry corps, which played a key role in the victory. In August, as the Ukrainian army, commanded by Simeon Petliura, advanced on Kiev from Galicia, the Nikin's forces entered the city. Cooperation between the two leaders was brief. The Nikin wanted to preserve Russia as an indivisible state, while Petliura sought to create an independent Ukraine. Political disagreement divided anti-Bolshevik forces and ultimately contributed to the white defeat. Untrained local conscripts weakened the unity of the white army. But Denikin believed his forces could prevail. On June the 3rd, he issued the Moscow Directive. His objective was to reach the Bolshevik capital. By early autumn, the Red Front had been penetrated. In August, 8,000 Don Cossacks, commanded by Konstantin Mamontov, broke through Red Lines, ravaged the Tambov region, and moved towards Varonyesh, linking up with Shkoro's Kuban Corps. In September, the Nikin's men were closer to Moscow than any white troops had been before. They took Ariol, a hundred miles from the Tula armament works and less than 200 miles from Moscow. A white victory seemed imminent and inevitable. But as Denikin's troops moved north, problems at the rear intensified. In the Ukraine, the anarchist army of Niesto Machno became stronger. Machno, Realizing a white victory would make his dream of a free Ukrainian peasantry impossible, hated Denikin. Rejecting all authority and refusing allegiance, he and his men fought fiercely against Germans, Petlyura, Denikin, and the Bolsheviks alike. They operated without ideological constraints, making and breaking alliances at will. Known as brave, vain, and pathologically cruel, Machno had about 30,000 followers. In the autumn of 1919, Machno's raids on the rear of Denikin's armies forced the general to divert the army corps to fight the guerrilla leader. Support for Denikin waned in the newly seized territories. The peasant population who expected the whites to restore order quickly became disillusioned. Corruption, profiteering and theft characterized the white army. Pillaging and violence became commonplace. Denikin encouraged pogroms. These vicious attacks against Jews were perpetrated not only by Denikin's forces, but also by the troops commanded by Kolchak and Yudjenich, by Makhno's peasants and all the Atamans. Considering anti-Semitism a creative force for national unity, Denikin permitted the extermination of Jews in the Ukraine on a scale only possible with an organized army. Petliura, Machno, and local unrest hampered Denikin, but only a well-trained fighting force could defeat him. Lenin urged everyone to fight Denikin. The Bolsheviks used recruiting tactics that had proven successful, propaganda and coercion. Between September the 1st and November the 15th, 
the Red High Command mobilized more than 100,000 soldiers to reinforce combat units on the southern and southwestern fronts. The reconstructed weapons industry supplied their arms. On October the 20th, the Red Army launched a counter-offensive. Denikin's outnumbered forces held Ariol for six days before they began to retreat. Earlier, Vereshilov and Budyonny's plans to create an elite Red Cavalry were opposed by Trotsky. But the success of Mamontov's Cossack raids proved the value of these units. And at the end of 1919, Semyon Budyonny formed the first cavalry army. Vereshilov and Budyonyi played the most critical roles in the victories of this army. Budyonyi's cavalrymen proved even more effective than Mamontov's Cossacks. On October the 24th, they defeated the White Cavalry near Voronezh, crossed the Don a month later, and drove a wedge between Denikin's center and his right flank. With his best units driven back 700 kilometers, Denikin was forced to retreat. In December, the Red Army recaptured Kharkov, Kiev, Odessa, and later Yekaterinoslav. In early January 1920, the Red Cavalry entered Rostov on the Don. In February, the White Army consolidated its position in the Kuban. Denikin left for the Crimea. Under pressure from his senior officers, he named Baron Wrangel his successor. On April the 4th, he departed for France. In the north, Red forces defended Petrograd. Nikolai Udenich's army tried repeatedly to enter the city. In 1918, former Tsarist General Udenich had emigrated to Finland and Estonia and, with German support, raised an army. Kolchak then appointed him commander of the Northwestern Forces. By 1919, Udenich had about 18,000 men and material provided by his British allies. On September the 28th, he launched an offensive against Petrograd. His early victories were halted by the onset of winter and poor leadership. Trotsky went to Petrograd to boost the morale of the city's defenders. He declared that Petrograd is the cradle of revolution and shall be held at any cost. Baltic seamen and workers rallied to strengthen the city's defenses. Within a month, the Reds drove Udenich from the major strategic sites his army occupied around Petrograd. The Whites retreated to Estonia. Lenin declared Bolshevik Russia a military camp. The Soviets committed all their forces to the front lines. 1919 had been the critical, decisive period when the tide of the war turned to the Bolsheviks. Strategic errors had forced the Reds to confront three enemies at once, yet they held and defended what they now called people's power. Mass mobilization, Iron discipline, effective propaganda, Cheka terror, and Lenin's extraordinary ability to make advantageous concessions gave the Reds the advantage. In late 1919, with their position more secure, the Bolsheviks began to plan the reconstruction of their economy. The party mobilized, while the Cheka searched for those who might impede the process.
in 1920, the Bolsheviks were opposed by armies in the West and the South. Pyotr Vrangil was the last leader of the White Movement. From the remnants of Denikin's army, Vrangil formed a 35,000 strong fighting force. Ignoring British advice to limit his actions to the defense of the Crimea, he fortified this position and prepared an offensive. Although Vrangil commanded the best officer cadre in the Civil War, he realized the impossibility of a victory over the five million soldiers of the Red Army. His objective was to conclude an armistice with the most advantageous terms and to keep the Crimea and the southern Ukraine outside Bolshevik control. In June, Vrangil began successful operations in the Kuban and in the Ukraine, taking the Reds by surprise, while most of the Bolsheviks' forces were deployed on the Polish front. Poland had 738,000 troops in the spring of 1920. 150,000 soldiers were prepared to advance against Soviet Russia in order to protect Poland's independence, which the Poles believed threatened by the new Bolshevik imperialism. Polish forces were numerically superior to Soviet troops on the southwestern front. The Allies supplied them with arms. French instructors trained the troops. The Poles and Petliura, whose tattered forces had found refuge in Poland, agreed to join forces. On April the 25th, 1920, the combined force launched an advance in the northwest of the Ukraine, from the Pripyat to the Dnieper. Marshal Joseph Pilsudski, a Polish revolutionary and the first head of the Polish state, led the army. Pilsudski's political objective was to create a federation of Poland, Lithuania and Belarusia. The Ukraine was to be granted independence, but first it had to be retaken. On April the 26th, Polish forces stormed the city of Zhytomyr. Eleven days later, they entered Kiev. After a string of major victories, Red Army commanders had allowed many units, including the 1st Cavalry Army, to rest at the rear. When the Poles threatened to seize the entire Ukraine, the 1st Cavalry Army was dispatched to the area. Red forces faced the Poles along two fronts, the southwestern, commanded by Alexander Yegorov, the western, commanded by Mikhail Tukhachevsky. Before the revolution, Tukhachevsky served in the Tsar's Imperial Guards. During World War I, he was captured by the Germans, but escaped. In 1918, he sided with the Bolsheviks and fought against Kolchak and Denikin. <laughs> 